If you haven't seen Dune Part 2, this video is unfortunately not for you. If you have, I did my best. Enjoy. I believe in dreams. I believe in their messages from the deep. They are amorphous and interpreted in thousands of languages, all of which are significant. I believe in arguing with them. I believe the world makes decisions for us. I believe in myself. I don't know if I believe in faith. I know I sat back in my chair once Uso reached the residency. I know I stopped breathing when Paul Muad'Dib Betraides slid his grip down the blade of Fate Rotha. I know I started smiling when he merged it into the Harkonnen's chest. I know I started breathing when Paul stomped his ascendancy down at the feet of the Emperor. I know I started thinking. I thought about how he stomped the same pitch he used to call the Shai Halud. I thought about how this was a creative choice. I know there was no music playing at this point. I know the sound of water can be heard crashing in the background as the camera waits on Paul's face. I know I waited. I thought about Christopher Nolan. I thought about how his intensity as a director comes from how he spars with ideas conceptually. I know he uses visuals to emphasize the power behind his scripts. Then I thought about Denis Villeneuve. I thought about how his intensity as a director, in large thanks to cinematographer Greg Frazier, comes from how he spars with ideas through imagery. I believe in his control over scale and scope, both figurative and contextual, how they work to achieve the ideal verisimilitude. I know his choice of dialogue is what we see when in frame, and his worlds are what we believe when out of it. I know what I feel with his imagery, what every frame says when it's more than a thousand words attached to them. I know it was here in this room where Dune became a warning to all other genres out there, to all the other houses of directors and their studios. I believe if you want to set the standard for how to master the art form, this is how you do it. I know never before has science fiction found its rightful steward, and now no other genre can compare. I believe this to be the tragic precedent of Dune Part 2, a story of cinematic poetry and science fiction history in one ambitious take. I believe I know what a masterpiece looks like. For your consideration. There are about a million different ways I could begin this essay, and all of them would feel artificial. There are about a million things within this film I could list, and trust me, I will try, but art is a process. Or as Killian Murphy would put it, it's not the duty of art to give the answers, just to ask the questions. It would feel completely inappropriate to undersell this cinematic experience as anything other than exactly what it is, and that specifically is one of the greatest films I have ever seen or that's ever been. To cite part one, the mystery of life isn't a problem to solve, but a reality to experience, a process that cannot be understood by stopping it. We must move with the flow of the process. We must join it. We must flow with it. So how does Dune accomplish this? The impossible. How does Dune fold love and ego and prophecy and messianic pretension and tragedy all in on itself until the themes are so tightly bound until the words lead them to paradise, tears the screen asunder under the iconic score of Hans Zimmer. The only way I can answer the questions that Dune asks as a piece of art is by not reviewing part two in the same way I review everything else. I refuse. It is pointless for me to attempt because I cannot commit to manufacturing nuance for the sake of it, nor conflating the scale of what I've seen. To do so would be a disservice to cinema. I have no quotas to reach, nor a desire for an algorithm-friendly runtime, and simply put, this is not a movie I sought out for its historic themes. I sought it primarily because I, a film fan, a cinema supporter, and admirer of this interpretation of Dune, I wanted to see if what we were promised was possible. 
Could this level of scale and sight and color and scope be achieved without losing a narrative backbone? Could you really define this cautionary tale for a modern age with everything it needed to hit and hit hard? But the themes wash over me like waves of Caladan as I walked out of the theater doors and could part two sit at the table with cinema's greatest, holding weight that is much more engrossing than its predecessor. Yes. Spoilers of course, but Dune Part 2 is everything you have ever heard it to be, and no, it's not perfect, but it is dangerously, unimaginably close. Cinematography is the first language of a film, and the decision to shoot part two almost exclusively on Arrakis is precisely how Villeneuve and Frazier achieve this never-before-seen level of verisimilitude. Not since the original Star Wars or Lord of the Rings has a fictional environment felt so performative yet candidly realistic, where the camera embodies every triumph and nuance of being present in the moment. It was a bit of a challenge to take in this much ambition in one sitting, but it was worth every additional rewatch, because Arrakis exudes a stunning physicality unrivaled by anything else in modern media. From vast set pieces that reinforce scale, to the creeping sunsets that coat the characters, the visuals of Part 2 are given a unified vision we have never seen articulated at this level. A seamless, ever-flowing becoming that communicates the space between its people and its story. Maybe the Two Towers in the early 2000s, or even Lawrence of Arabia back in the day are the more appropriate comparisons when it comes to the composition of various scales, but even still, what's been achieved here is nothing short of a technical miracle, regardless of the year or technology. By circumventing a traditional three-act story structure and doubling down on the visual evolution of this trilogy, Part 2 elaborates, harmonizes, and then bursts at the seam with artistic richness far beyond what Part 1 was capable of. By just letting moments exist as they are, you fully represent real art. Because real art always appreciates the older it grows. Part 2 lives in a color grade that is as transportive as it is intoxicating, and it allows for depth with the visuals on screen and the characters we follow. It is a gift that Greg Frazier was given the opportunity to revisit this sandbox once again, and he absolutely finds more complicated layers in this world as Villeneuve finds his own. Affording them both a few years' time to refine every shot and every story beat has led to one of the greatest pairings of brain and bronze a literary translation could have. This is a film that is so intentionally immense, but it never neglects the presence of its smaller sets, and why their intimacy works. Part 2 breaks all the notions of what's possible with a camera by translating the visual depth of this story, how the characters can stand at a distance with the world, with each other, how the frame can collapse in on subjects when a connection is being formed, how the landscape can change to reflect the emotional arcs that are given time to breathe, how the sky might open up when it's time to raise the stakes. Is every scene with Paul and Chani walking through the twilight always necessary? Is every hold on the eyes of a Fremen follower always required? Technically, no. But this experience wouldn't work without those directions. This wouldn't be Dune without those shots that illuminate the sensibilities. This wouldn't feel like an oasis of humanity's distant future without the camera invading that privacy. This wasn't simply extra footage on the editing table, this is the lifeblood of an epic. The imagery in this film tells the plot and the visual exercise is what follows. An ideal representative of what cinema can be at its purest where the audience uses the ambiguity left over to fill in the gaps. Every frame, every pace change, every chapter. Experiencing this becomes an instinctual exercise in the appreciation of cinema rather than just an intellectual one. To stamp ourselves into the experience as it happens not because the dialogue isn't feeding us what we want, but because this is a movie you read as much as you watch. This is Villeneuve's Lawrence of Arabia, and succumbing to the totality of old-fashioned movie making with how it combines relationships, politics, religion, cultural fanaticism, and ever-shifting perspective into just one hyper-realistic core that is critical of its world and inhabitants. That is how you go beyond the camera to inspire a video like this. If a movie can leave you feeling inspired somehow, and how you approach art or how you live vicariously through it, then you have to celebrate it. This is the kind of sci-fi that feels lived in, from its cultures to its religions to its technology and politics, all married with brutal intimacy through close-ups and stunning wide shots. This is how science fiction was meant to be envisioned in film.
Dune Part 2 is a visually groundbreaking, meticulously detailed, and excruciatingly passionate interpretation of its source material. A film about destruction and aestheticism all on the same axis, all portrayed through a cinematic goliath that captures the feeling of reading the books, embodying the soul of Dune with precision and personality. It feels different to know you're watching a genre, a director, a cinematic experience achieve history in real time. It becomes a level of self-awareness that's as rare for an audience as it is sacred to be a part of. I mean, I quite literally sat there in the theater thinking, okay, this is history happening. Dune 2 is not just a movie to watch, but a vision to experience. In the same way Blade Runner 2049 nailed the dystopian futuristic noir and the atmosphere that came with it, from its landscapes to its fine particulates, Dune has now achieved a religious and spiritual verisimilitude for science fiction that seemed impossible to achieve in the current science fiction zeitgeist. The most important attributes of the genre come from those expressions of our species. It is what drives the story of our history and, in the same breath, the story of Dune. Those connections will always transcend time and space, for as long as we are humans, we are full of faith. As long as we have dreams, we are spiritual. It's just nice to know that Villeneuve sees this too. To capture that essence is to walk a line, a balance of excitement and horrification. Roger Deakins managed to transform Los Angeles, but Greg Frazier became Arrakis. It's impossible to talk about the movie without talking about the first thing you notice when coming into the world, and without mincing words, this is one of the greatest photographed movies of all time, choreographed by the greatest scientific mind to ever sit in the director's chair. In many ways, I was overwhelmed with how much I connected with the story in part two considering that my general appreciation for Dune up until this point was much more because of the sum of its parts, the totality. The control Villeneuve has over the audience when connecting with Paul and Chani, with Stilgar and Usul, even with a character's faith in their faith, to then reorienting us as mere observers of mass exposition. That, to me, is a mastery of the technical understanding behind high-level filmmaking. Watching Paul and Chani sandwalk together is one of the most human and emotionally humbling moments I've ever had with a film. I found myself imprinting so much of my own life into their meanderings that even a six-second glide through the twilight caught me by surprise. It's these moments littered throughout part two where I could feel myself being changed as a viewer in real time. And that speaks largely to the accomplishment that is this type of cinema, that I can walk away completely different as a person than when I entered, without the intention of doing so. This movie moved me in ways I didn't expect, and the best part is that it all plays into the benefit of the story. A reluctant messiah who fulfills his prophecy, but not for the reasons he'd want. A love story as common as they come, but drawn more poetically than it ever should have been. And a crescendo of rebellious spirit that is as hauntingly beautiful as it is cautionary. The fact that this story can work with as much purposeful ambiguity as it has, and hit harder every subsequent rewatch, is a testament to the prowess of its director and his command over the visual language. I love stories about revolution, just on their concepts alone, and this is one of the best there has ever been because it excels at the execution of every single idea. This is what makes it feel historic, even in the moment. Speaking of becoming and rising to meet the moment, let's talk about Paul and how Timothy Chalamet solidified himself as the titular character in this epic. It is rare to see an actor embody a character with such command that the screen feels like it stops when they're rising to meet the moment. To be the face of an odyssey like Dune and to be worthy of that crown by outright earning it, to embrace the big moments and lead through them, surrounded by an ensemble cast that rivals any cinematic trilogy, that is something I didn't think I'd see for a long time. As much as this world embraces the soul of the story, Timothy embraces the spirit of this tragedy, and he does so as the title character in every setting that asks Paul to hit that next gear. From falling for Chani and embracing the culture of the Fremen, to his slow shift in tone with Jessica with all of the rage building underneath, to his march down south to the War Council, and all of it coming ahead in the throne room throwdown, Paul is asked to convey so much maturity and so many pivotal moments that are not spared a single emotion as it unfolds. While part one was enough of an introduction to his character, I felt like the anchor to his experience was missing for me. I was more fascinated by the world than the protagonist. I wanted to know why Paul works. And not that he didn't have the narrative shading to back his character or that the stakes weren't dire enough, but as this reluctant duke fighting against manufactured fanaticisms, false prophecies, and the like, what was it about his story that was different? 
Well, we finally get to see the full picture here, which is that Paul works because he is so human. One who loves and hates and fears and acts not purely out of preservation, but protection and revenge. He is so flawed in such an impossible situation that you can't help but hope he finds a narrow way through. You root for the hope of alternatives, though you know the sacrifices are coming regardless. We are not meant to be him. This is not for idolization or transposition. We are meant to recognize him, to see parts of ourselves from every angle, for better or worse. It's a tether that holds together his sunken costs and needs for revenge, as well as his commitment to honor and love. The biggest shock is just in how he plays the game when it's time to play, not that he's playing it. It's a story about consequential loss and victory at the expense of the present, and it marries these themes with cinematography that brings out those emotions. Paul is now narratively antithetical to his father in how he's conquered Arrakis, how he protects his house, even how he views power as a means to an end. The line about winning the war by being a Harkonnen was not just for dramatic effect, it was the movie telling you exactly where it's going, and it's awesome. We even get an entire color palette switch once Paul makes his decision to bring the Emperor down and start the Holy War. We jump from warm oranges on a serene oasis and Paul saying, I'm not here to lead, to a muted sunrise and stark greys that are washed out as he points the way, all throughout the rest of the film until the final duel. The emphasis on the visuals matching the thematic, right when Paul becomes more Harkonnen, is brilliant. That duplicity by Villeneuve is the art of filmmaking, the art of balance. To shift between being a fan of the universe and a fan of cinema on a dime is maybe more impressive than a direct one-for-one -one adaptation of this book. To bring humanity through in the exploration of doubt, through the spirituality of dreams, and align it all behind how every character moves narratively, it's incredible vision control. Denis is able to adapt to the expectations of any genre he works in. It's what makes him so good. Almost every critical moment with Paul is executed to perfection. You have the best a worm ride has ever looked, followed by a poignant lesson on the acceptance of legacy, followed by teachings with the Fremen that then pave his way through the South to the greatest on-screen duel since Luke and Vader in Return of the Jedi. All of it is perfect. The use of Paul and Chani's love theme in the final scene is perverse for all the right reasons. It feels wrong, and yet it's so powerful because it is the one score you know hits the hardest, and it devastates the final shot of the film. This movie knows what it's doing. In all honesty, you don't have to love Dune. You barely even have to like it, but the experience I had with Part 2 is as fundamentally soulful as you'll find in cinema today, and as important to our humanity as they come. I didn't need Part 2 to be a story about the overt dangers of messianic worship and the ethics around blind faith. I just needed it to tell the exact story that it's telling and to do so with the passion it displayed in every single frame. Before this trilogy kicked off, I had barely understood the optics going into Part 1. I hadn't yet read the books, and it took time to learn the world as it was and why this story seemed to matter to so many people. But holy fuck, if you didn't walk out of Part 2 changed in some way or shape, then are you really watching? Are you really listening? Once you view this film as a visual exercise of cinema, it changes entirely how you bring yourself into it, how you watch it, how you resonate with it. This culmination, like Oppenheimer before it, like only a few films from the past few years, this is why I give myself to film. Why we have built an audience of over 24,000 who I'm sure feel the same. This is why we want to be, asked to be, and continuously demand to be challenged by film because what we see is how we connect, and what we connect with is what we feel. Isn't that the point? Let's put it like this. Villeneuve has achieved the purest distillation of filmmaking that is humanly possible, and you know it because that thought enters your head every 15 minutes when watching this film. I think that to be in the presence of a visionary in their prime, like with Nolan, is to welcome a connection with an art form so important that it encourages us to be vulnerable during the experience, because everything it takes from you, it gives back tenfold. Villeneuve is a master at reorienting the audience and how they digest the visual language of his worlds. We are seeing, hearing, and feeling the crescendo of a living genre as it was meant to be seen, heard, and felt. A singular understanding of all of the best practices in a 200-year-old genre through a century-old medium, 
all of it paying respect to the history it leans on. A painstaking level of detail and thoughtful composition, wearing the history of sci-fi on his chest as a badge of honor and doing so in fundamentally epic fashion. This is how all films should be practiced. In a world where AI encroaches on every facet of creativity, where it threatens the importance of real art and our visionaries, Dune Part 2 shows that no program will ever be able to achieve this level of grandeur or humanity. How do you combat the onslaught of lackluster television and streaming demands? You make this. For my closing thoughts, I thought it would be rather appropriate to do a little lightning round where I give some of my more immediate praises of the story that really worked for me. Please do not mistake my passion as pretentiousness, I just love what this film brought to my life, and I hope you did too. The opening act of this movie is one of the most striking introductions I have ever seen for any film. The mastery over atmosphere and soundscape draws you into the suffocating hold, and then the lighting over Arrakis just haunts this screen slowly, methodically. It casts this amazing shadow over the stakes of the story just as we jump in and as things progress. Obviously, I want to talk about Chani and Paul, which might be my favorite on-screen relationship since Peter and Gamora, simply because of how Villeneuve uses their emotions together. Chani is often positioned as the depth between Paul and the world. She becomes his literal distance, and we see how far he's willing to go by her unmoving position to the Fremen. The film rests on both of their shoulders to lead the conflict both internally and externally, and it works. You believe that this kid can lead the uprising and take on the houses for Arrakis to be free. It is a cautionary coming-of-age story for a young messiah that is realized only because it is counterbalanced by Chani's role in the story. She is as important to part two as Paul is, as Stilgar's tragic fall to blind religion is. I don't know how or why, but watching two people simply sandwalk together at night made me feel things I can't fully articulate even in a script. It's a feeling I think we've all felt at some point when thinking of faraway places or people we love. It's one of those you know it when you feel it moments that you get in life, and sometimes you get it in cinema. And all of the moments in this movie where I could have felt it, the two times I did were during this early scene and right after Paul ascends to the throne and watches Chani leave. I love that it came from these two moments. I love how part two plays with the audience's depth, how our axis as spectators is pulled in and out of the emotional conflicts and politics and world building in such short time. That's where the visual storytelling really kicks in where it marries the grandeur of the macro with the gravity of the micro. Villeneuve has always been great at that. He's always found a way to show the distance with his characters that brings the audience along as their own camera. But if you don't find that shade of storytelling particularly enticing, then this experience will largely be lost on you. And that's okay. Because this is very much a different experience, in that it's meant to be an experience, less of a deconstruction, more of a realization. It's not just a big technical and directorial showcase, it is a showcase of all of the best forms of filmmaking, and there are so many showcases here to enjoy. Speaking of, all of Gady Prime as an example. It goes down the line from intense to execution, but the Harkonnen homeworld is a leech of hope with the architecture and weapons to back it. It reminded me a bit of New Phyrexia, shout out to five or six people who might understand that, like ticks that corrupt everything they touch in an aesthetic that is as cold and draining as they come. I mean, it literally drains the color from your skin and lulls you into this droning coma. It's awesome. Fade Rotha is an engaging antagonist who literally pulls no punches and elevates the combat moments of this story. As I've always said, violence should just be used to elevate a story's narrative by bringing out the little things in the characters, and we get that. I love how often the dialogue in this movie is turned off and we get a chance just to simply live in the moment. The collision of sound design and scenery together gives us this spectacle, the rawest form of cinema you can make. The language of film is cinematography, and if you command it well, you can hit layers in the human experience that are as poetic as any big monologue could ever achieve. It also helps when this film is backed by some of the most impressive sound design in science fiction, something again Denis Villeneuve has always had a talent for. The buzz of ornithopters, the thunderous landing of Harkonnen ships, the chirping of Fremen chatter, and the quaint drafts of wind along the sands. This movie is a booming ocean of sensory overload that kicks everything into another stratosphere. How rare it is to walk away from a movie knowing that every part of its construction changed me somehow, 
where the experience of watching it become what it is along its emotional, thematic, narrative, and technical spectrum has as much kineticism as the story itself. It is such an elevation of quality in every possible way compared to part one that it feels like you're rediscovering this entire world for the first time. This is the pinnacle of science fiction storytelling, visuals, and presence, unmasked in its entirety. This is a film worth celebrating, because yes, it is absolutely one of the greatest films ever made on a technical achievement and visionary achievement alone. As a kid, it was the original trilogy and prequel trilogy. As an adult, it will be the Dune trilogy, a quintessential science fiction experience, a story about tragedy and the culmination of a century's worth of work in one field, all in around three hours. It is Denis Villeneuve's greatest accomplishment, Greg Frazier's greatest resume piece, and Hans Zimmer's greatest score since Interstellar. I know a lot of times I can succumb to the experience of a film and thus my ramblings become ramblings, but sometimes having nothing left to say is exactly what I want to happen. Dune Part 2 is a masterpiece, and I am grateful to experience it in my lifetime. I love this film, and that's all I have to say. And as always, thanks for watching.